excellencies distinguished guests and colleagues we are about to commence uh, today's program may i request you all to kindly switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent mode thank you it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's talk on current developments in the afghan peace process by mr mohammad umar daud zai chief executive of the afghan high peace council and chairman of the consultative lawyer jirga preparatory committee i take this opportunity to thank each one of you for accepting our invitation and attending today's event i would like to brief you about today's program the event is chaired by ambassador vivek kaju former ambassador of india to afghanistan dr t c a raghavan director general indian council of world affairs will make the welcome remarks it will be followed by the opening remarks by chair ambassador vivek kaju subsequently mr mohammad umar daud zai will deliver today's talk the talk will be followed by q and a session conducted by the chair who will also make his closing remarks may i now request ambassador vivek kaju to kindly conduct the proceedings thank you sir uh, chair ha huh? well thank you thank you very much uh, mr vivek kaju ambassador daud zai uh, may i begin by expressing uh, the gratitude of the council to mr daud zai for having found the time during uh, his visit to delhi to visit the council and uh, give our members an opportunity to uh, interact uh, with you uh, mr daud zai of course is a very well known public figure and diplomat of afghanistan and uh, we happen to serve together in pakistan at one stage so it is wonderful to welcome a old friend and old colleague to uh, the indian council of world affairs we are also very grateful that mr vivek kaju is here to chair this uh, uh, conference this seminar's proceedings as also so many other colleagues from uh, kabul who are present here to hear mr daud zai Uh, ambassador as you would see there is a great deal of interest in in india about developments in afghanistan in the council itself in the past 6 months we have had a number of high level visitors from afghanistan we had mr amdullah saleh here a few months earlier uh, a little after that we had the national security advisor uh, addressing us a few weeks ago we had a group of civil society representatives and members of parliament uh, essentially to talk to our members about uh, the situation in afghanistan and how events are uh, developing over there so your presence and your address will uh, will help all of us understand the situation uh, better and also enable us to uh, get a better idea and a better appreciation of the overall context of the internal situation in afghanistan in the context of what is happening uh, with the united states with pakistan with saudi arabia uh, etc with these remarks may i welcome you most warmly again to the council and also say what a great pleasure it is for me personally to meet you again pleasure. thank you very much and i would request mr kaju now to chair the proceedings uh, <coughs> thank you raghavan uh, may i thank you and the council for inviting me to chair this session mm, let me begin on a slightly personal note i recollect uh, first meeting mr daud zai uh, at the kandhar airport in december of 1999 uh, when a uh, ic814 uh, aircraft had been hijacked he was then the undp is working with the undp in islamabad and he had come uh, to uh, kandhar that was not a particularly happy time for us or for our afghan friends but over the last 20 years mr daud zai is become an established uh, public figure in uh, afghanistan's national life 
He has distinguished himself as a civil servant, as an international civil servant, as a diplomat, and as someone who's taken, who's participated in politics. He's held uh, numerous distinguished positions, uh, including the uh, the minister of, he's been the minister of interior. He's been Afghanistan's ambassador to two neighboring countries of Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan. He's been chief of staff of the president. So we couldn't have a better person uh, to tell us about what is happening in the, in the Afghan peace process. India, of course, has vital interests in the Afghan peace process. Uh, India has vital stakes in Afghanistan and um, I think I can safely say that there is no one in India who does not want Afghanistan to return to peace and stability because peace and stability in Afghanistan is in the vital interests of our entire region. And uh, there is, if I may uh, submit uh, to Mr. Daudzai's consideration, a certain amount of, uh, of um, of miss over what is actually taking place in Afghanistan. The situation seems to be full of contradictions, whether it is the security situation or the political situation. Or we are not very clear about what is happening on the economic front. Similarly, uh, we are not clear with how the political process within Afghanistan is going. Uh, with regard to the elections, which have been post presidential elections, which have been postponed twice. But above everything else, uh, looms the negotiations between the Americans and the Taliban. Uh, we would very eagerly await your comments and your insights into these processes, and perhaps there is no one who is better placed today about these uh, developments, so I won't stand between you, sir, and the people who assembled here. Was yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me take the opportunity, first of all, to thank the Indian Council of um, World Affairs giving me the opportunity to come and talk to such a distinguished uh, audience and also the opportunity to meet so many old friends and colleagues all in, at once. I may have had the opportunity to meet you one-on-one -on -one or separate, but to meet you all here, that's, that's a great honor. So thank you, uh, uh, ICWA. Uh, before going to actual subjects, uh, let me also um, share my experience and my, my thoughts about my two colleagues. Um, when I was serving in, in Islam, but, uh, I realized that uh, um, there was not many visits uh, from embassy to the Indian ambassador's house, and I went one evening for a dinner. And uh, another guest who arrived, he said, there were so many police outside in the streets. What is it? And he said, it's because Daudze is here. <laughs> so <laughs> it's strange for the Islam about police. <laughs> and then I, I met Ambassador Kanjo, it's true, in um, uh, Kandahar on a very sad occasion, the hijacking of the Indian plane. Which if, if you, if I, uh, if uh, I see that, wanted, I can come a, come occasion and give extensive presentation because I can't tackle that subject in just a few a few minutes. It's a very long subject and there's a lot of aspects that um, uh, I, I think people in India don't know about it. But one memory I will share with you. Many years after that I was watching uh, ZTV and uh, the captain at that time of, of the plane was uh, a guest uh, in, in talks there. 
and uh, he was asked uh, how were they treated and he said well um, they were uh, sending us food from outside uh, with a very big non uh, <laughs> like a towel uh, with a chicken wrapped inside it <laughs> and uh, he said I, I gave them a call and said uh, we don't like chicken mo most of them they would actually prefer uh, dal and rice but they were not eating anyway because they were so depressed and the anchor asked them so what did you do with that uh, big naan he said we used it as a towel <laughs> So there's a lot to say about that nine days uh, um, of a very tragic uh, um, episode. So coming back to today's world, I will talk to you, if you allow me, about uh, basically three uh, main topics. And if uh, you ask me questions about other topics, I would be at your disposal. About uh, peace, about uh, democracy, and about defense. These three subjects I, um, I, I will talk initially. But first on, the, on peace, because that's the most important subject, um, and uh, there are a few facts about it. One of the facts is that there is a complete unanimity inside Afghanistan, inside the country, that everybody wants an end to the war. Um, Forty years of violence is enough. Uh, people are born under violence, uh, and now they have gray beard. Uh, they have grown to 40 or above, and the war is still continuing. So they haven't seen uh, peaceful Afghanistan. Uh, I may be one of the few lucky that I have seen peaceful Afghanistan uh, before the war. I, I remember the, the trouble in the Afghanistan where Couples from the neighboring countries will come to spend their honeymoon in, in Kabul and uh, in Bamiyan and in mazar -e sharif And uh, when, again, a memory of Islamabad, when I was serving there, I came across many couples who said that uh, they were going to Kabul, uh, taking a bus, spending a couple of days to watch uh, Indian movies in uh, cinemas in Kabul because they were prohibited in Islamabad, so they will travel all the way to Kabul to watch Indian movies. So many of those sweet memories I have, and I, uh, I'm one of the few that have that memory. I consider it as an obligation of my generation, so at least when, when, when we leave this world, we hand over in Afghanistan to the next generation that's peaceful, that they would say that, okay, thank you, you have left a good thing for us. Not that um, Tahiri would say that, what is that you have left for us? <laughs> we can't live in it and we can't sell it. So I hope I, I can see um, uh, those days. Anyway, there's uh, 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 unanimity. All Afghans believe that it's time that the violence ends and the war is over. And this is what was evident in the lawyer jerga we just held. Um, now, I will come to the lawyer jerga a bit later, but I will start uh, with the new era that has started. The new era is uh, one year old. It started with the U.S. Um, presidential instruction, or, or whatever you call it, to look for ways and means to end the war. So it was about a year ago that the Deputy uh, uh, Foreign Minister of U.S., uh, Madam Alice Willis, she visited uh, Kabul a couple of times. And I was at that time not working with government, not working with High Peace Council. I was a sort of opposition, or you can call it a, a political group outside the government. So she consulted me also in group and also um, uh, private. Now, as I understood, all Afghans that mattered and that the U.S. consulted, they told them, yes, the time was right that you speak to Taliban face to face. But then most of us put a condition and a clear advice to it. One of it was that don't enter into negotiation with Taliban, because Taliban is not the state, it's not the government. And also, those understanding you are creating and the uh, talks and contacts you may conduct should not be prolonged. 
it should be short, one, once or twice, and then the, the third time should be the Afghan government and Taliban uh, talking to each other. But they started. The first meeting between Taliban and the U.S. was with uh, Madame Alice Willis, and then uh, they appointed Ambassador Khalilzad, who came with a new team. And in no time, he took it to the level of negotiations with, Tal with Taliban. And it's still continuing, um, although uh, in principle, um, uh, he and his team is regularly sharing information with us as government and with us as the High Peace Council. But we are not sure that how much they are sharing with us. Is that the whole truth that they are sharing with us, or it's, is it something is left that they are not sharing with us? We don't know about that. But at least uh, each time uh, Khalil Zad arrives to the region, he comes to Kabul and meet with government and with the political elites, and then go and talk with Taliban and then come back to Kabul and debrief us. But some circles in Kabul are complaining that not enough is shared with them. I personally uh, am in a position to say that uh, maybe he has shared um, as much as uh, was possible for him. Uh, probably that's because I carry two hats. And uh, before going on in this subject, I, uh, on this hats issue also, I want to say a couple of words. Uh, for four years, I had no hat, uh, sitting home, uh, resting and waiting, or basically having no title. And all of the sudden, you say two titles, I have actually five titles. <laughs> And um, the, the two others are President's Special Envoy on Regional Consensus Building and Spokesperson for the um, uh, Leadership Council on Reconciliation, which is the top leaders' council. And sometimes with media in Afghanistan want to quote me, they gave a call to Tahiri and say, which title of him shall we use? So <laughs> this is life. You know, sometimes you have no title and sometimes you have too many. So anyway, coming back to the hats uh, and Ambassador Khalil Zad sharing information with us. Uh, as much as I know, uh, I, I'm, I'm willing and more than happy to share with you as we move along. But one thing is clear, that uh, people of Afghanistan look more optimistic uh, from the start of the talks between uh, America and Taliban. Generally, people are more optimistic. That's one, one truth. And the second truth is that Taliban profile was, went up. They benefited politically. And the, the level that Taliban benefited politically does not reflect the ground realities at the battlefield, which I will come later under the title of... Uh, uh, under the title of uh, defense, I, I will uh, come there to. So anyway, uh, people are optimistic, uh, but also uh, people are pessimistic. Also, uh, why are you know, they pessimistic? That I alluded to earlier because they think that the talk went to for too long, and uh, the real party, one side, uh, that the government, is missing in that talk. So that's the uh, source of uh, uh, their pessimism. Now, under any circumstances, um, uh, there were four topics that came under discussion between the U.S. and Taliban. And sequence was, which is important in this kind of circumstances, sequences is important. They say uh, the first topic was the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The second one was the um, uh, Taliban's relationship with uh, terrorism and terrorists. The third one was intra-Afghan dialogue. And the fourth one was the um, ceasefire. Now, on the first one, where they are, um, although various different versions have been circulated in different languages has been used, but as far as I know, uh, Taliban asked for a withdrawal schedule uh, that should not exceed six months. While the U.S. has 
told him that we are not interested to stay in Afghanistan forever, but the withdrawal has to be after the peace agreement. So that all Afghans ask us to leave, then we can present a uh, schedule for withdrawal. We cannot present a schedule of withdrawal or based on demand of one segment of the Afghan society that through the Taliban. So as far as I know, this is the real position. That in principle, they have said we are not interested to stay here forever, but our withdrawal depends on peace and on peace deal. And post peace deal, if all Afghans together ask us to leave, then we present you a schedule of withdrawal. Either Taliban misunderstood initially or they intentionally want to misunderstand. They gave a different version that Americans have agreed with them that they would, they would withdraw soon. On the second topic also, various languages were used, various versions were circulated, like um, Americans asked Taliban to give a guarantee that Afghan soil will not be used any, against any other country. That was not the case, because uh, nobody considered Taliban to be uh, the rulers of the whole of the country or nobody assumed that they will take over the whole of the country, that they, then they gave a guarantee that the country will not be used against another one. Um, Americans' explanation was that uh, uh, we refer to the areas that are under their control and the areas that remain under their control until uh, a complete uh, implementation of the peace agreement. So until then, if there are areas under their control, then they should make sure that that area is not used against the third country. Now, there is gray area in that language also. Um, in our view, we would have expected that the clear language was used that Taliban should cut ties with all terrorist and extremist groups um, and, uh, and have no ties, no collaboration, no cooperation, and together with the state, fight uh, against terrorist groups if necessary. That's the language we would have expected. Now, lately, U.S. told us that that's the kind of language they're switching to. Uh, and they said, spe even specifically, Taliban used the language that uh, we were in the past uh, somehow linked to Al-Qaeda, we are willing to mention the name Al-Qaeda, that we will have no longer have a relationship with Al-Qaeda. But anyway, there may have been some level of understanding on these two uh, topics, but the U.S. Uh, representative clearly said, and he is repeatedly saying that uh, there is no agreement on any issue until and unless there is agreement on all issues. So that's the, the overriding um, uh, uh, picture. So then, uh, just before the lawyer Jerga, the US uh, representative came to us and said, uh, now it's time that an inter-Afghan dialogue take place in Qatar. Uh, we, at that stage, were thinking of lawyer Jerga. So initially, our government position was that let's wait for the lawyer Jerga to refresh our mandate from the people of Afghanistan, to give us guidance on how far can we go, and to give us a framework for talks. And then after the lawyer Jerga, we can go to Qatar. But then they insisted, and because we are partners, strategic partners, so the Afghan government agreed that, uh, OK, we can go to Doha, and then lawyer Jerga can take place. But we resisted changing the uh, Jirga date. Uh, that we stick to. Uh, preparation for uh, Qatar uh, was underway in the small list, medium list, big, big list, extra, extra, XX large list. Finally, it became uh, 250, and that became a sort of a joke, and then uh, everything was on halt. Uh, it didn't take place. We switched back to the lawyer Jirga, which we had decided not to change the date. Now let me see a few words on the Jirga, and then we can come back to any question that uh, you may have. Now this Jirga was held uh, with a purpose to, re to refresh presidential mandate on talking to Taliban, because um, we don't have a referendum system, and we don't have uh, party-based uh, politics 
that president consult the public and consult his party. Uh, our tradition is that whenever a president faces a major decision, has to go to Loya Jarga. And that's the forum where uh, things can be discussed and president can take mandate, can take guidance. The last Loya Jarga on peace um, and on reconciliation was held in 2010 when President Karzai taught the same way that he needed a fresh mandate on talking to Taliban. And in that Loya Jarga, uh, representative recommended uh, establishment of the High Peace Council. So now it was time that uh, President Ghani also felt that he has to go back to Loya Jirga. But there was some, uh, something unique about this Loya Jirga. First of all, in terms of size, it is the biggest Loya Jirga of the history of Afghanistan. Um, as you know, in the modern history, uh, the most uh, prominent Loya Jirga was in 1747, when Ahmad Shah Abdali became the king and the, the territory was called Afghanistan from that date onward. So uh, then throughout that, there are dozens of Loya Jirgas that uh, various rulers have held. Uh, before this Loya Jirga, the biggest one was what Dr. Najibullah has held in uh, 1986 or 87, I think, and in uh, more or less the same location at Polytechnique. He called in 2,000 uh, delegates. Uh, here, this time, uh, the number of delegates was 3,383. But then what was quite unique about this Loya Jirga was all delegates were elected. Not elected by, through direct votes, that there is ballot box and everybody uh, goes and vote. It's indirect, like um, uh, leaders of various walks of life will gather in a geographical area in a big hall, and then they vote or they simply raise their hand and and choose uh, somebody as their uh, representative. So nobody was appointed. Uh, uh, everybody came through this indirect uh, election system. There were two principles that we attached to this Loya Jirga. And luckily, we, we met those two principles, although it was the shortest period of time. One was that there should be at least 30% women members, which was, uh, again, unprecedented. And uh, happily reporting that uh, at the end we had 30.5 percent women, and uh, it was not easy uh, because uh, from very far districts we had to make sure that women have opportunity to be elected and come there. And the, uh, the uh, second principle was that, uh, and this was a basically presidential instruction also not in a decree, but verbal instruction, that he said he wanted to make sure that uh, no Afghan anywhere in the world feels that he or she is not represented. So practically, if we implemented that in practice, that meant that from every district in Afghanistan, there had to be a representation. And not every district in Afghanistan is under government control. There are some districts that are under Taliban control. So we choose that objective that we want to make sure that even from Taliban controlled districts there should be representation. And luckily that happened. Out of 386 districts altogether, uh, 381 districts had representation. And uh, based on population, at least one representative from every district was, was a must. And from some district where they had more than one district, then again we put, we press that there should be a woman also uh, representing that district. And from the furthest districts, like um, remote districts in Pakhtia, in Nuristan, which ambassadors are uh, familiar with that geography, we had women representation, and they were interviewed by media. It's not my claim. Media interviewed them, and they were broadcasted through the Liberty Radio and many others. So anyway, uh, that uh, five districts that failed to send representative, four of them are districts that we as government never controlled them. It was uh, two districts in Helmand, which is called Bagran and Dishu. Right from the beginning until now, we have never controlled, and we don't know what's going on there. Um, that may be where uh, Daesh is growing or breeding, or maybe Taliban too is breeding, or we don't know what's going on there. 
Now the other two districts were one in Khaki Afghan and Zabul and the other one in Nawa. One district which was quite safe and secure, it was in Parwan in uh, Kalan. That was also deprived, but it was their choice. They wanted twice the number we, we could give them, we, number of representatives were allocated based on population. They wanted twice more, saying we were the center of resistance in, in the war against Taliban, we have been given so much sacrifices, we should be given a double number. That was not a criteria that the commission would accept, so the commission rejected their demand and they said we are not sending delegates. So the fifth uh, district was that. So this principle of uh, uh, Afghans uh, represented, uh, having representation was met to my satisfaction. We had one Afghan from Australia, we had a few Afghans from US, we had many from, um, uh, from uh, Europe also. But they were not given, that representation was not given based on uh, population. The uh, Afghans with prominence were contacted. If they want to come, they could come. And that's how people came. Uh, refugees from Pakistan attended, refugees from Iran attended. And then we had other national categories. And um, I'm going to mention one very important category that we recognized for the first time, war victims. And war victims we divided into two categories, the uh, civil, civilian uh, victims and the families of military that have been killed in the war. And the reason we brought them in is because we knew from district under control of Taliban or reconciled Taliban will be there in the Loya Jirga, and they will bring their perspective. We wanted to bring the other perspective also from the other extreme who are screaming everywhere in media and say, we don't want reconciliation with Taliban. We want Taliban leaders to be in court, not, not in, uh, in ministry or, or, or elsewhere. So we brought that category also. The proceedings of Loya Jirga had three portions, uh, an opening which is basically political, and then the committee works. The rep delegates were divided into 50 committees. And that's where the real debate took place. Uh, the uh, uh, deputy chair and secretaries of the entire Loya Jirga was directly elected through ballot boxes. And uh, in the committees also, they choose their um, uh, chair and uh, their uh, reporters. And the debates there were quite interesting. Um, again, there we noticed that there was complete unanimity on the need for peace. But how to go for it? And what kind of concessions are we willing to give for peace? There were serious differences of opinion. And that's what we wanted to be reflected. And that's what we, we called it the framework for talk. Because uh, 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 some members uh, uh, didn't want uh, um, altogether a reconciliation, but majority wanted. But those who wanted it uh, gave us some limitations, and that's what we were seeking. Like, for instance, they circled some articles of the Constitution, saying those articles are not for negotiation. Like the name of the state, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. They said this is not for negotiation. Freedom of speech, um, uh, rights of women to education, to work, to exercise their political rights, all these were circled as red, that they are, they are not for negotiation. But other articles are. So I think on this subject, uh, probably I have said uh, enough. But on the two other subjects, I will uh, be briefer than this one. Now, the two others is, uh, one is democracy, uh, which we are grateful for India because we get inspiration uh, from India. Our democracy gets inspiration from India. But more practically, uh, our parliament is built uh, by India, by Indian money, by Indian engineers, and which is the, one of the big, the biggest and, the, and, and one of the most attractive facility in this whole region. Uh, and it is functioning, and India has been helping us in, in terms of making parliament functional, exchange of parliamentarian, training, all sorts of support is there. For a while, uh, parliamentary proceedings were disrupted because for three years, parliamentary election was delayed. Finally, it was held last year, and it became problematic. Uh, thanks God, um, two weeks ago, the new parliament was opened, and yesterday they had. 
uh, election for speakership. Um, uh, they, nobody uh, succeeded to get 50% uh, plus one vote, which was required. So there would be a runoff. And if in the runoff again, if uh, somebody failed to secure that, the new candidates will come. The democratic uh, and parliamentary uh, exercises a contract, which we are very happy, and then now we can happily go to presidential election. I'm sure you may have heard that 22nd May is the end of President Ghani's term, and there should be interim government and caretaker. I think these are a part of uh, campaign issues. They're not real issues, because the uh, Supreme Court is the main body that gave interpretation of the Constitution, and their interpretation is that president continue until uh, a new president is elected. But there is another article that is also important, which says that president is for five years. Now, President Ghani's five years completes on 29th of September. So at least until that date, there is no real issue of legitima uh, legitimacy. And that's why the d new date for election is fixed on 28th, 28th of September. And on that one, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that it will take place. It may take place even before, because we have a new commission. The old commission was dismissed, and it's a new commission. Now, the new commission may come a bit forward to be on safe side, because if there is a runoff and then winter comes, so the, I know there is debate within the new commission that they might bring the date a bit forward. Uh, uh, and while, uh, why, uh, another reason that uh, why I say I'm, I'm sure it will take place, they had funding problem, and then government decided to give them funding. Then international friends came, no, no, we also want to give you funding, but um, we will have some say on the level of transparency. So funding is not a problem, commission is not a problem. Uh, uh, why, why should it not take place? The problem was that it should be biometric. Now they have given up because the new commission is of the opinion that they don't have enough time to go for bi biometric. Even the whole year may not be enough to, to switch to, to biometric. But let me assure you on that, that the 22nd May is not a big issue, and the presidential election will take place on 28th of September. But what happened after that is very difficult to predict. Because uh, each time we had presidential election, there had been problems after that. And it would be a miracle that we have the election 28th September, and then there is no problem. There may be problem, uh, but uh, for me, the result is um, uh, predictable. My personal prediction is that we will see a replica of the past five years. This, could, this kind of arrangement could be replicated, but it will not be smooth to, 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 to come to a replica. There may be a problem, there may be mediation, and then we end up uh, with another national unity government, basically with the same faces. But that's my personal prediction. I don't know. The last uh, issue is uh, uh, defense. And again, we are grateful to India. Um, the, the basic principle is that you can have meaningful dialogue and meaningful uh, and sustainable peace if you have a strong state. If the state is weaker in, in terms of legitimacy and performance, and in terms of uh, looking after itself and defending its people's security, then you can't have meaningful dialogue with the other side. Uh, in that case, then you have a dialogue between two warring factions. The war in Afghanistan is not between two warring factions. <laughs> A state on one side, and there is a warring faction on the other side. Now, <clears throat> for, for that state to remain strong, um, uh, uh, India, together with the United States, has played a great role in keeping the state strong. And uh, while talking of keeping the state uh, strong, it's a democratic identity, good governance, all those are important. But when you are in the middle of war, your security and defense institutions become the most important thing. And um, uh, you have heard in the news that yesterday uh, two helicopters were handed over and two more will be coming. And this is a token. This is an example of the many different kinds of support India is providing to Afghan state institutions, particularly security and defense institutions, and we are grateful for that. Now, 
this is my last part. Uh, uh, as I said uh, uh, in the beginning, that um, Taliban profile, political profile, is gone up because the U.S. started talking to them. But we are not critical of U.S. talking to them because it, we were consulted. But then uh, that situation is not reflective enough of the level of the situation in battlefield. The uh, situation in battlefield is very different this year. Last year, the year before, and the year before, each time spring started, two or three provinces were on the verge of collapse. We were, we were afraid that, uh, like last year this time, Para, Ghazni, and Kunduz were on the verge of collapse, and Baghlan was under severe pressure. This year, that's not the case. Some of the districts that were always under control of Taliban and considered as their stronghold are on the verge of collapse. No province is under pressure, no important district is under pressure. Districts under Taliban control are under pressure. So in a way, from defensive, we are into offensive. Our forces are in offensive. And another good example of their good performance was securing the Loya Jirga. Taliban had rejected the Loya Jirga. It had many other enemies also. But within the radius of 40 kilometers in the neighboring provinces, it was fully secured, not a single bullet was shot. Not that Taliban had decided not to attack it. That was not the case. 102 attempts were foiled, were foiled and uh, prevented, uh, and people arrested. So that means the um, uh, defense side is growing. It has grown up enough. It's not up to the task that you can perform independently. We, we, for a long time, we will need help. We will need assistance. But it's much better the year than the year before and, and the year before. And one particular part of our, our forces is the special forces, which we think are the best in this region, because they've grown up in the middle of the war. And uh, some of their recent and latest operations, which uh, I follow, um, I, I'm not a military person by background, but as I was Minister of Interior for a while, I can understand that language. So I can see how much efficient they have uh, become and uh, how uh, committed they are. So I think uh, with that note, I will uh, stop there and uh, see questions. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for covering such a wide area and uh, giving us insights, your personal insights on what uh, is happening. Thank you also for keeping to the time. Okay. So we have now I, 20... I never looked at the clock. <laughs> I did. It was here. <laughs> uh, we have now 25 minutes, and since I think um, there will be many questions, uh, may I request questions to be brief, and please identify yourself, and one question. I'll be quite uh, quite ruthless in implementing. <laughs> Let me tell you. Let's start. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm Vijay Naik. I just one question. That, uh, what is the role of Pakistan in uh, Afghanistan? Because we always hear that it's a, it's a, it plays a destabilizing role in Pakistan. And what is the connection of Pakistan, uh, Pakistan with Taliban? And how you look at the situation, whether there will be instability in Afghanistan in the future, if the things go in the hands of Taliban. Thank you. Would you like to take a number and then we answer? Or, uh, whichever I think we can do three questions way. at a time. Okay. You okay. have some. Yes, uh, sir. Thanks, Salam from Iran. My question is, India's role in the entire process, in the peace process, and you met with the Indian External Affairs Minister. So what transpired during those conversations, including your meeting with the NSA? That's too well. I, I let, it, let it pass. Mm -hmm. Yes, madam. Have the mic, please. Can you identify yourself. I'm please? Dr. Shalini Chawla from Center for Air Pass Studies. So I just I'm curious to know how big is the ISIS presence in Afghanistan? Because we keep hearing contradictory narratives on that. Does Taliban see it as a competition to their presence? I think uh, you have three rather large yes. areas now. <laughs> Pakistan. Uh, yeah. India, your conversations, and of course, ISIS. Yeah. 
Uh, on Pakistan, we all know the background that um, Taliban uh, was born there and um, how they helped them to take over Kabul and the, the rest of the country. And then as Afghanistan is always an accident-prone country, um, accident uh, drive away <laughs> plan. So uh, the 9-11 uh, basically uh, reversed uh, that, that plan the Taliban take over the whole country. That relationship between Taliban and Pakistan remains. Um, we have asked uh, our U.S. Uh, colleagues and partners that in those four issues I mentioned, um, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, topics of discussion between U.S. and Taliban, we have uh, say, uh, uh, said to them that they should also include uh, clarification of Taliban's relationship with Pakistan because it's important for us that they clarify. The U.S. is interested in clarification of Taliban's relationship with the terrorists and terrorism and extremism. That's important for us, but we are adding that they should clarify their relationship with Pakistan. Now, uh, w another fact is that uh, when Mullah Brother appeared in Qatar, he traveled from Pakistan. Now, some days, uh, him and many of them may go back to Pakistan. So that explains the whole uh, relationship. But uh, uh, on the other hand, Pakistan's contribution to the peace is that so far they are claiming and stating that they have helped uh, the American Taliban talks to take place in Qatar. They have not offered uh, the Afghan government in Taliban talks to be facilitated by Pakistan or Pakistan help. And that's our demand from them. They should facilitate uh, government and Taliban talks. So far, they are not very clear. And in the near future, President Ghani will be traveling to Pakistan. This will be one of the topic of discussion. I cannot uh, predict the um, outcome of it. Now, that notion uh, that uh, Taliban take over the country, that's the wrong way to put it. Um, I think Taliban can join the state, uh, can join the, the rest of Afghans. The rest of Afghans cannot join Taliban. It's, uh, um, that's not the right way to put it. So when the, when the right time comes, when the solution emerges, it will be Taliban joining the rest of the country. How would Taliban ben Pakistan benefit from that? Obviously, one, one way to look at it is that uh, the Taliban being part of the larger system, uh, Pakistan may feel more confident in terms of securing their um, interest. That's a question of debate, uh, how and to what extent, but it's a bit too early to, to, to judge on that. Uh, uh, India's role is key in the peace process, and uh, 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 Madam Foreign Minister very clearly said that India cannot sign a dotted line. Uh, and the line should be very clear, and then India could subscribe to that, could be part of it. Um, and that explained the whole thing in, uh, in that one sentence, that India wants to be part of it, wants to be uh, clear about its interest and about that converged Afghan-India um, uh, interest. And we also uh, have our um, uh, request to India uh, to, to do more note sharing with us, and that time uh, gave us uh, support in the region and at uh, the global level. Uh, we are fully satisfied with the support we get from India and uh, with the level of interaction uh, we have um, uh, uh, with India. And, you know, this region is not anonymous. There are different pages and uh, different countries are in different pages. I think uh, India and Afghanistan are very much on the same page, and we are not alone. The, the number of countries that are shifting to that page is increasing. So that's good news. More details, maybe later. Uh, ISIS uh, is a problem in Afghanistan, uh, but it's not as big as Taliban. Taliban is still the problem number one. Uh, now, the, the, there is a difference uh, between uh, uh, ISIS and Taliban. Uh, we may have various definitions of ISIS. There may be different versions of ISIS. Uh, some ISIS, maybe Taliban too, uh, may have split from Taliban and have shifted the title, shifted the badge, and called themselves uh, ISIS. Some of them may be the real ISIS that uh, was born in, uh, in Syria and Iraq. 
Now, which one is which one? It requires uh, research. Uh, some ISIS the, uh, are the uh, regional terrorist groups, such as ETIM, uh, IMU, and others. They have also shifted badges when it suited them to be to call themselves Al Qaeda. They call themselves Al Qaeda, and then for a while they shifted their name to ISIS. What is different for us between Taliban and, uh, and ISIS is because Taliban is a rural phenomena. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a village phenomena. Uh, Taliban. ISIS is uh, a more urban and more academic phenomena. We, we see uh, in um, uh, universities, uh, even to the level of professors, uh, um, uh, our, our security forces uh, trace, have traced them, have got them, uh, some of the attacks that has taken place in cities that has been traced to, to, to university, the Kabul University, Nangarhar University. So that's a different between, difference between Daesh and, um, uh, and, uh, and Taliban. Now, in terms of relationship between Taliban and Daesh, it, def it depends. Some of those Daesh who might be Taliban too, they may have a good relationship or they tolerate each other. Uh, but the Daesh that are ideologically very different from uh, Taliban, they fight each other. In terms of territory, uh, in Nangrahar, uh, or in other words, provinces neighboring with Pakistan, there we saw Taliban fighting Daesh. But uh, in Badakhshan and uh, Takhar, uh, they are tolerating each other. In Kunduz, they are collaborating with each other. So it's uh, different from one province to another. So the other uh, thing that you may want to know is the, the, the total strength, it's estimated to be around 4,000 um, ISIS, ISIS, around 4,000 in the whole of the country. Uh, thank you. The next round, yes, sir. Please. You'll need a mic. There a mic. I wanted to talk to Please you about... Please identify the, yourself. Yeah, I'm Kunal Singh from Hindustan Times. I wanted to ask you about the Moscow process of dialogue, and obviously you were invited and so was Ambassador Raghwan. So, but given that Russia has been playing some sort of a putsi with Taliban as well, and, and also with uh, Pakistan, do you think that Moscow process is one sincere, and do you think Russians are um, neutral in this game? Yes, thanks. Good evening, sir. I'm uh, Swati from Center for Air Power Studies. So my question is on the security situation, that if ANSF are not adequately equipped right now, that means that the resolute support mission is going to stay in the country. On uh, that regards, uh, has there been any talks between the Taliban and US? Uh, Vishal Chandra, IDSA. Sir, I would like to have your views uh, on uh, China's uh, perception about the Doha talks, uh, the kind of role that China is playing at the moment, and uh, also that of Iran. And my second question is, how no, united no, are sorry, Taliban? Sorry, one question okay. that is China, right. <laughs> that is limited to China. Okay. So you have a question, sir, on China. Yeah. You have a question um, on Moscow talks. And, and on one. NDSF. That's right. Okay. Good. Oh, Moscow uh, was uh, kind of first uh, title uh, intra-Afghan dialogue. Um, now, we have some uh, questions on this term, intra-Afghan dialogue, it's too broad. Anywhere two Afghans sitting and talking can be called uh, intra-Afghan dialogue. That's not what we mean. Afghan dialogue means uh, Afghan government and Taliban, which are the two sides of the war. And now Moscow had one side, which was uh, Taliban, and uh, then they invited uh, other political groups from Afghanistan. And basically, the political groups that went there, they listened to a lecture of the Taliban. Um, and that also, in a way, uh, raised Taliban's profile politically. So that is why we had reservation about it, and we didn't go to to, to, to Moscow. But principally, any where Afghans sit and talk about peace, it, it's good. We, we encourage it. 
uh, but it has to be um, towards the, the same aim, and they have to move in one direction where uh, we get closer to the objectives. But uh, uh, um, Moscow, in that sense, had some positive elements, but I think it was more on damaging side. They, they, it was a damage to the actual process. Um, and mind you, there is Moscow intra-Afghan dialogue, and there is Moscow forum. It's a very different thing, and I think your question was not on Moscow forum. It was on um, uh, Moscow. Russia, on the one hand, expresses concern that the growing uh, ISIS uh, presence in North Afghanistan is a threat for them. Uh, and they see ta uh, friendship with Taliban as a solution to that. I don't think we subscribe to that. I think a uh, solution to fight Daesh is a strong Afghan state. The stronger you have the NDSF, then the, the easy to tackle uh, um, uh, Daesh. Uh, uh, I mean, you can't kill uh, one virus with another virus. It becomes a du double problem. So, an army and to the Afghan security forces, and those enablers to be properly used, you need coaching and training. And uh, since 2014, RS role in Afghanistan is uh, coaching and training. And on the basis of the BSA, we, si we have signed with the US, and so far we have signed with NATO. That cooperation continue until 2024. After 2024, those treaties have to be renewed. Now, uh, RS presence uh, in Afghanistan in that sense of coaching and training, it has nothing to do uh, with the peace process or any other country. Uh, uh, China. China's primary uh, concern is um, ATIM, uh, which used to be present in uh, North Waziristan, and uh, after the Operation Zarbayaz, they were pushed into Afghanistan, and they entrenched in Badakhshan, closer to, to China. And that's a matter of concern uh, for China, and uh, for the past two, three years, China and uh, the Afghan government are engaged and uh, um, how to cooperate in uh, tackling ATIM. Uh, that's one, m one major area of their co immediate concern. But of course, as you may know, they're also concerned about CPEC, which is uh, the biggest project uh, China and Pakistan uh, are going to be engaged, uh, which the Pakistanis call it the game changer. If it's a game changer, then it's a very important project. And uh, CPEC security, is uh, affected by what is going on in Afghanistan. So China should be concerned. Uh, as uh, far as we are concerned, we consider China's intentions to be sincere for ending the war and bringing sustainable peace to Afghanistan. Yes, I am Fazlur Rahman from Indian Council of World Affairs. So my question is that we haven't heard anything about the role of Saudi Arabia for a long time. Have they abandoned Afghanistan because of Qatar involvement? We have not heard anything. What is happening at that front, basically? What Saudi Arabia is doing and how may they have been influencing the policy in Afghanistan? Thank you. Um, my name is Indrani Bagh. Uh, what is your assessment of the trilateral agreement that was just signed between the U.S., China, and Russia? Sir, did you want to ask? I will. Okay. Geeta Mohan from India Today. I just wanted you to respond to the question of China, uh, China's role and Iran's role. He'd also ask about Iran. Ambassador, can't you say, don't respond. <laughs> no, you can. Okay. No, you can. <laughs> and and when, uh, when uh, Ambassador Sood asks the question, yeah. I'll, he'll have three questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Dalzai, for a very extensive briefing. I, uh, you know, it was very encouraging. You said that elections will take place, and uh, it was a good thing. But 
mean, will they take place irrespective of, is it dependent on how the talks with Taliban continue? Do they need to have some kind of an outcome there for a successful, credible election? Or will it take place irrespective and talks will also continue or anything like that? Or what kind of political developments in the dialogue with Taliban are necessary for a credible election to take place by 28 September? Okay, shall I go? Mm -hmm. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, if you remember last year, there was um, uh, supposedly uh, U.S. Taliban talks to take place in Abu Dhabi. And uh, then uh, we were told that the next day the Afghan government and Taliban talks will take place. And Afghan government delegation rushed to Abu Dhabi. But then we found that uh, Taliban were not willing to uh, talk to Afghan government delegation, saying they are not authorized. Uh, that was basically Saudi Arabia's initiative, which uh, Emirate was doing it in partnership and on behalf of Saudi Arabia. But because it went bad, uh, they got angry with Taliban, with Pakistan, with the whole process. And then Pakistanis, in order to please uh, Khalilzad, they told him to come to Islamabad, we will arrange a meeting for you in Islamabad with Taliban. And when he traveled there, again that didn't take place, and he was told, if you want to meet with Taliban, then go to Qatar. And then he went to Qatar and started, talk started in Qatar, and that's how Pakistanis claim that they have facilitated. So Saudi Arabia sends them is in the loop. It's, uh, that country is important for Afghanistan in terms of our regional relationship, religious relationship. Emirate is also an uh, important country in the region and our bilateral relationship. But in this talks between America and Taliban, they are not seemingly there directly, but I'm sure Americans might be you know, keeping them aware of what's going on. But as we progress, they would certainly have to be brought into the loop and be part of the solution because they are important player. Now, the trilateral agreement, it wasn't agreement. It was a forum. The three countries met. Um, and then they thought that they would invite uh, uh, in the next meeting that's supposed to be in Beijing, they would invite uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, Iran. It's not yet sorted out that uh, how they would be invited, would they accept, uh, it's uh, an ongoing process. Uh, now, from our point of view, uh, any, any level of uh, coordination at the region, it's yeah. useful, it's good. Uh, we welcome that. Uh, but uh, we are concerned of multiplicity of initiative because then it be we lose the way, uh, which one is more important, which one is less important. And as uh, President Special Envoy, part of my job is to develop that uh, coordination. Um, I don't uh, call it consensus because that's too difficult to be developed uh, in the region we are, but a certain level of coordination uh, we can develop. And in that role, I'm complimenting um, Ambassador Khalilzad because he's playing that role. Now, he has certain limitations, and we have certain limitations. But together, we have uh, better prospects of uh, succeeding. Now, uh, Iran uh, has a unique position uh, in this region because it's a clear, uh, declared enemy of the US. And uh, enemy of the enemy is friend. So <laughs> that's how they see uh, Taliban. But on the other hand, when it comes to peace talks, the regional coordination, Iran is very close to that same page that Afghanistan and India is. So Iran is close to that page. We have no particular complaint. Of course, I mean, the animosity with US, that's beyond our control. We can't do anything about that. Uh, but in the past 18 years, uh, despite the fact that the two countries were enemy, but uh, for Afghanistan, they were working together in Afghanistan and helping uh, and working in the same system. So that's why uh, we, we consider Iran as a good neighbor, as a healthy neighbor for us, regardless of their relationship with any other country. So we don't have any complaint from Iran. On uh, election uh, and peace, uh, 
Um, initially, Ambassador Khalilzad and his team had at some point said that um, peace first and then uh, election. Um, some other Afghan politicians had also said that. But now, uh, lately, uh, the U.S. changed its position and said we have to be realistic. There cannot be peace before 28th of September. Uh, therefore, elections should go ahead. And uh, Madame Mogherini, who was recently visiting Kabul, she put it the right way. She said we have to focus on election as if there was no peace process, and we have to focus on the peace process as if there were no election. So this is the way uh, Europe is moving. And we also prefer that way because we have to be realistic. Before 28th of September, there cannot be any peace deal. The election has to take place. And we cannot afford, I mean, democracy in Afghanistan cannot afford that we postpone the election beyond 28th of September. So that's why I assured you that it will, it will happen. Now, how good it will be, what will be the outcome, that's all open to be seen. You have time for one more question. Uh, what do you feel uh, about the utility of an instrument such as a interim unity government uh, to facilitate the peace process? Hmm. Now, in the very un unlikely <laughs> event that will be in the near future, that we witness a final peace agreement between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Then as an outcome of that, um, that agreement, if there is need for interim setup, then most Afghans would, uh, um, not, uh, uh, would not reject it. Uh, otherwise, if there is no uh, peace deal signed with Taliban, there is no need for interim government because it's non-constitutional. It's stepping out of the constitution. And stepping out of constitution is easy. Coming in is very, very difficult under the circumstances we are. But my own take is that it's totally unnecessary because constitution is responsive enough. It is providing enough room for maneuver. But if in the unlikely event in the near future, if final deal is made with Taliban, then that's a different scenario. We will take it there. Under the circum foreseeable circumstances, there is no need for uh, interim or caretaker. Uh, the current constitution is responsive enough. Well, uh, we've reached 510. Since I've been principal, I was a discipline civil servant, and I've been given instructions of ending at 510. Then speak for five minutes. I will go for it. Uh, thank you, sir, for clarifying uh, many things and your insights into a host of, of matters concerning the present situation. But I'll focus on what you said at the very last. Uh, for a long time, the paradigm that uh, some of us who observe Afghanistan had thought of was that there will be negotiations between uh, an Afghan constitutional government and the Taliban. And that is what uh, President Ghani and the National Unity Government uh, were also doing, as it seemed to us, to be inviting the Taliban to come and discuss issues. And uh, for that purpose, if I recollect correctly, last year, Gov. President Ghani had uh, even offered that the Taliban could open an office in Kabul. Now, uh, it seems that um, the situation is changing. That the lawyer Jirga has uh, specified certain no-go areas as far as the Constitution Concerned, including, as you articulated, uh, the name of the Afghan state. Uh, that is a, a great pointer because, as of now, if 
file sab so, i'm correct what i read they read in the papers the taliban are insisting that they are the afghan emirates up uh, and then you mention certain other no go areas up uh, but certainly it seems now that um, there will be a much wider process with regard to the constitutional arrangements of afghanistan as part of this peace process so um, in this i think uh, as far as the region is concerned we will await whatever you do with the great anticipation it will be a complex complex exercise because in some ways it will be opening up the entire process that had taken place from one to the interim government to the transitional government to constitution make and then the election of 2004 and 9 and 14 and even now a uh, but in interest of peace if that is what is required and if the afghan people want that want to walk that road then i suppose for all of us it should be perfectly okay the only other thing i'll mention is that it was very heartening to hear whatever you had to say about india afghan ties uh, I think I can speak for all of us here when uh, I say that uh, in India there is a complete consensus on the importance of its relationship with Afghanistan. Governments may come, governments may go, but on this point, I think there is unanimity that uh, whichever way the Indian state can can uh, cooperate with Afghanistan. for our mutual benefit that is the way to go ahead so on that we can be absolutely certain that uh, there will be as all i can see no dilution of this relationship uh, my final point is that um, you mentioned about india's role as a democracy in uh, uh, in in clarifying certain issues relating to democratic function and exceedingly gratifying to note that this process is continuing i will only recall that uh, i remember well the, the day when president karzai had come and had told me that he and his colleague wanted india to build the parliament building i have a very vivid memory of that meeting. and uh, i had of course told him like any ambassador would that the chief of the government to take a decision to respond to the request but i also added that i could see no government ever saying no and that it would be a matter of great privilege and honor for us to construct that because it will be an abiding in abiding um, um, symbol of our uh, i am happy to know that that building is there and the of parliament five i can do thank you very much by the way oh wonderful it's open in august oh really No, no, Darul Aman. In front of the Badi. Yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah. Oh. Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank On you. behalf of the council, I extend uh, my sincere thanks to the honourable speaker, Mr. Umar Daudzai, for giving us the insight to your talk on the current developments in the Afghan peace process. I also express gratitude to Ambassador Vivek Kaju for chairing the session and giving his remarks. We have a present uh, for our esteemed uh, guest. May I request DG ICWA to kindly deliver our publications.
With this, we come to the conclusion of the program, and all the guests are invited for the refreshments at the foyer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.